Good afternoon. <laughs> All right, so today we'll get started with our presenter, Delisle Paulette. And mostly I'll start the seminar by giving a background of the person of where they're from, but today I'm going to start a bit differently and, and tell the story of what, how um, Delisle is the most flexible person, um, I think, at the university. And I don't mean like stretching flexible, I mean... Definitely I mean, not. <laughs> so two weeks ago today, I received a message that there was potentially a mix-up in an external speaker that was coming in to present, and they were going to present on March 7th. And so then I emailed Delisle, and I, and I apologized and said, you know, Delisle, could you be flexible to move your dates because we potentially have an overlap with the speaker? And Delisle said, yes, for sure, Mike, I can help you out. I'll move to another date. One week later, so as of Thursday last week, received a message that that speaker was sick and couldn't come and present on the 7th as of today. So then I sent another message to Delisle, apologizing frequently and frequently for, for the mix-up. And um, I was really out on a, on a limb there, thinking that yeah, I wouldn't expect Delisle to, to step up and I'd be giving the seminar today. But um, Delisle was very helpful and agreed to give this presentation on the 7th. So, um, I'd like to give a thank you for Delisle for stepping up for, for today. So if you, uh, if you don't know Delisle, Delisle started with his undergraduate degree at University of Alberta in physics and bioscience as a double major. And he did a number of different research projects with uh, gravity currents as well as microstructure arrangement of insect wings. After his undergraduate degree, he then did his master's at UOC with uh, Dave Rival studying rapid change in Pershing behavior. And now he's doing his uh, PhD here at UOC with Dr. Uh, John uh, Bertram and studying quadrupedal locomotion, reduced gravity running, and optimization in leg uh, locomotion. So in general, Del Delisle is fascinated with uh, using simple models to explain complex biological processes. And he also has a number of different interests, and that is in mechanics of flight, non-wetting biological surfaces, fish swimming, and constraints on insect size. And down the road, he'd like to be a comparative biomechanist, uh, researching biomechanics, and then teaching that to biologists. And one of the, the interesting things about Delia, when asked what his proudest scientific accomplishment, he said that he did a blind taste test to prove to his wife that she couldn't tell the difference between whether tea had either milk poured into it first or after the tea had been poured. So milk into tea versus tea into milk. Now this is interesting because I don't know if Delisle knows this, but Ronald Fisher did the exact same test when uh, he was at a tea party where a woman had claimed that she was able to tell the difference whether the tea had been prepared, either milk into tea or tea into milk. And different from Delisle's wife though, that woman was able to show the difference oh, interesting. With, okay. with her tasting. Well, my methods are far superior. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a few fun facts uh, for Delisle. Delisle's happily married with two children and one more to come in June. He was once bitten by a flying squirrel. <laughs> but the drawback that he stated is that he didn't develop any superpowers as a result of being bit. Delisle is also a conver or is conversational in Esperanto which is a constructed universal language, which is a combination of English, German, Polish, Russian, and French. And Delisle said that he can answer your questions in Esperanto. <laughs> no, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't say that, sorry. Uh, so today, Delisle will be speaking on the mechanical logic of quadru quadrupedal gait. Thank you, thank you, Mike. Uh, all right, so of course, the natural place to start with quadrupeds is with bipeds. And um, I will argue that the, biped the bipedal gait repertoire is actually quite limited. So uh, we typically will just walk or run, um, but if we're feeling quite jovial, we might uh, skip along. Or if we're feeling overcome with emotion, maybe we'll hop around. But basically, these are the four gates that are available to us. And sure, within, within each, there's some modification. Uh, such as the enigmatic Bertram skip. Um, I've never seen anyone skip like this before. Um, so yeah, if you can help us with this very promising area of research, that would be, that would be great. Um, but if you, um, so there's, there's many different things you can do within each gate, but one way of, of parameterizing gate 
as a finite uh, uh, set of possibilities is with contact sequences. So what we have here is um, a one represents that a limb is in contact with the ground and a zero represents that it isn't. We have a column for left limb and right limb, and this is going up in time. So we can see some with these event sequences, uh, some gates familiar to us, walking with uh, alternating single and double limb stance, running with alternating single stance and flight time, and then skipping, either leading with the right limb or the left limb, and various forms of hopping. And this is it. If you make some assumptions like each limb can only come in contact with the ground once and then has to leave the ground, um, and, and then it cycles again, these are all the options available to bipeds. Now, quadrupeds have a few more options. Um, and here they are. And that's half of them. Um, and yet, despite having way more options in terms of footfall uh, timing and sequence, they only choose about 20. Um, so the question is, they they can do a lot, and yet they choose to do a very small amount. Now, your argument against me might be like, well, maybe it's just that these gates are the only ones that are possible. Maybe it's that the other gates are more difficult to control, or they just aren't able to put their feet down in that order. And I will counter argue with these three dogs, uh, none of which are quadrupedal anymore, but used to be, but you wouldn't know it just looking at them. This one has two legs, for example. So all this to show that they're doing just fine with three legs. Uh, they've adapted quite well to their new reality. And this is to show that gait is very plastic, even for quadrupeds, even if you have more limbs that you have to control. So of all the gates available, why are only a few selected? And the idea that I want to bring forward to you is that it's because it's an optimization process. So if you, if you parameterize gate by, say, a combination of controls, things that you can vary, well, then each combination of these controls could, in, in theory, result in a different set of gates, which means you have infinite array of possibilities. But if you're optimizing on something like, say, the metabolic cost of transport, then that transfers it to a finite series of local optima and only a small number or usually just one global optimum. So to put this in maybe more intuitive terms, if you're a quadruped and you need to get across the yard, well, you could crawl all the way there, but it might be simpler to just get up and walk, right? Might be a little easier. So if your task as an organism is to get from one point to another, there are ways you can do that efficiently and there are ways you can do that inefficiently. And it just so happens that by and large, quadrupeds tend to choose those gates that are most efficient. So this is a very famous study uh, uh, exploring that idea um, done in 1981 by Hoyt and Taylor. What they did is they got these horses to walk, trot, and gallop on a treadmill outside of their normal speed range. So normally a uh, horse would transition from a walk to trot around here, and they got the horses to trot even slower than that. What they found is that if they measured metabolic cost of transport, that walking was optimal at slow speeds, trotting optimal at uh, intermediate speeds, and galloping was optimal at the highest speeds, representing the transition that we see naturally in horses from walking to trotting to galloping. As well, if they, at, when they let these horses to roam freely in a pasture, they noticed that the horses tended to choose speeds that were clustered around the minima on these cost landscapes. So it seems that the metabolic cost is a good predictor of gait choice. But we're only looking at three gates, and these are gates that the horses already naturally do. I mean, what if there was some super trot, right, that is, is even more efficient than this, and horses just don't do because maybe there's some morphological constraint, maybe there's some phylogenetic constraint. We don't know using this approach. It's also not quite clear what exactly is the link between metabolic cost and the kinematics that we observe in these gates. So I hope to explore those questions today. Um, first of all, is gate selection consistent with an energy optimization process? If so, what is that link between kinematics and metabolics? And finally, which morphological features matter? As Mike said, I like simple models. So I'm trying to develop the simplest possible <laughs> model that can explain um, uh, gate 
um, as far as far as we'd like. And so this model just consists of a rigid trunk with legs that can extend and contract. They're completely massless otherwise. Um, and so all you need to parameterize this is the hip to shoulder length, the high limb <coughs> maximum length, the forelimb maximum length, and the center of mass position, mass, and moment of inertia. So just six morphological parameters. And then your kinematic parameters are your horizontal speed and your stride length, which then of course gives you your stride time. Now we can actually make this even simpler if we normalize to mass and to the hip shoulder length. Um, and so we only need four morphological parameters and two kinematic parameters as inputs into this model. And now we need to get this thing to move and we need to figure out how is its movement pattern related to uh, some costs. So the way we'll do that is with trajectory optimization, which um, is just a fancy way of taking stuff that can change continuously with time and turning it into something that a computer can optimize for you. So let's suppose that there are certain things that an organism can control, for example, limb forces through time, and each combination of those controls has an associated cost, for example, work. What trajectory optimization does is it starts with a guess of the set of controls and follows that cost surface downhill till it arrives at a local optimum. If you do this many different times with lots of different guesses, you can get a sense of what all the local optima are on this cost surface. Um, but with this technique and this really simple model, um, you just need a very small number of inputs and you can get a whole bunch of outputs. So the computer is gonna optimize limb forces and time, limb extension, body pitch, center of mass kinematics, football positions, and other things um, from just a very small number of morphological inputs. We'll use domestic dogs as our uh, case study here. Um, and again, we're just using the hip uh, position and, oh, sorry, the hip position and the shoulder position. The distance between them gives us our, uh, our torso length and the distance from each uh, joint to the ground, uh, to the uh, uh, contact of ground for that associated limb is just the, the limb length. And the limb is allowed to extend just up to that length, but it can get as short as it, as it wants to. Okay, so now we need a cost. And the cost that I'm going to start with is limb work. And so all that is, is just what is the force um, uh, multiplied by the change of that limb in time and the forces can only act along that limb. And so that gives you the instantaneous power. And so the assumption here that I'm making is basically that all the extension and contraction that you see in the limb is, is aggregated into one pretend uh, strut that can extend and contract. So I'm ignoring all uh, the different joints that form part of uh, the upper and lower part of the leg. And we're just focusing on what is the gross behavior uh, and looking at um, the work associated with that. So this model is very simple and there's very few constraints, which means that anything is possible, physics permitting, and you can put that on a motivational po poster and stick that on your wall. Um, I find that very inspiring. Um, so this is an example of a solution that is locally optimal, uh, but obviously very unnatural. But it satisfies the constraints. For example, one of the constraints is that this cannot go through the ground, and it does not go through the ground. It does very well to prevent itself from flying through the floor. Um, so this is to show you that there's many different possibilities for what a gate could be. For example, we don't even need to use all our limbs. We could just use three if we wanted to. We could even forget about two of them and just walk on two legs if we wanted to. And this model allows all of those possibilities and more um, as solutions to the problem. But we don't just want solutions, we want optimal solutions. And so this is uh, one of them for this particular speed. And so what we have is the model predictions here and here. We have some dog I found on YouTube. Um, I matched the speed and we're going to see how it matches the behavior. <clears throat> so we can see that um, we get really good uh, foot contact timing, matches up really well. Um, we get pitching of the body uh, that we see in the dog as well, though maybe it's a bit exaggerated in the model. But it seems like we're doing pretty good in terms of predicting that gait. Now you'll notice that my cost here is limb work plus force rates. Um, so we have to include a force rate term um, for the model and I'll explain why this is important. 
Um, so what we have here is vertical ground reaction force uh, over stance time. And the black is what dogs naturally do. And this blue is the work minimizing solution or close to it. And so if work minimizing solutions tend to have very impulsive forces, which of course is not uh, realistic. And so uh, what I initially did was um, add a force rate term just to smooth this out so that I could solve it numerically. But as I did some research, I found out that there's actually biological, there's, there's evidence that it is a biologically relevant parameter. Um, so what you can do is you can, if you make the force rate really large, then you get very smooth forces with these very low peaks here. But then if you find just the right value, you can get peaks that look qualitatively like what you're going for. So there is um, a little bit of tuning that's involved, but not very much. And, and there's some indication that this force rate term has biological significance. Um, here's one of the first studies that looked at that um, in humans. Um, Doki and Kuo in 2007 had a very simple experiment. Where what they did is they got people to swing their legs um, at different frequencies, but they controlled the work by changing the amplitude. So at, at low frequency, they would have a high amplitude. At high frequency, they'd have a low amplitude. And so the work that they're doing is constant. But as the frequency of the leg swing increases, the metabolic rate goes up. So there's an indication that maybe it's activation uh, and deactivation of muscle. Maybe it is something to do with actually the change of the muscular force in time that results in an increase in metabolic rate um, as you do that more quickly. Um, so this is a, a parameter that seems important for predicting ground reaction forces. It's also a parameter that's important for predicting duty factor. But um, what I want to emphasize is it's just one thing that we change and we get a lot out of it. So this is duty factor as a function of speed for our dog model. Here's uh, the um, empirical values uh, shown here. And duty factor is just a fraction of the time that the limbs are in contact with the ground over the whole stride. Um, so this is what the work minimizing solution would be. It would be to have a duty factor of 0.5 when you're walking and a duty factor of zero when you're running. The reason for this is easy to understand in running. Basically, any fore aft acceleration uh, costs you energy. It's basically wasted energy. So it's best to just push up and avoid that fore aft um, work. Um, and so that's why duty factor should be zero. But if we tune our model so that we just match that single point right there, then we get really good matching duty factors for the rest of the cases, except down here. And I'll get, later on, I'll get into why that might be the case. But it seems like we just change one thing and we get a lot of agreement later on. So is gate selection consistent with an energy optimization process? For walking, it appears to be. If so, what is the link between kinematics and metabolics? Well what seems to work really well is limb work with a small force rate penalty. Now, I've only talked about walking so far, um, but we know that dogs transition from walking to trotting to galloping as they increase their speed. What we see here is a walking solution and a trotting solution. Um, this is a gate diagram, which basically means that uh, a bar representing the time that uh, a particular limb is in contact with the ground. This is left hind, left front, right hind, right, right forward. So this is a typical walking solution and the, and the dark bar is where the solution, uh, the optimal solution matches the empirical. So you can see really good overlap in walking, see really good overlap in trotting. And again, this trotting solution is something that the model spontaneously discovers at a higher speed. <clears throat> what you also see is a difference in the ground reaction force. So people often talk about uh, walking as being stereo stereotyped by a double hump ground reaction force profile. And trotting or running is being characterized by a single hump profile. And some people will argue that this is entirely due to springs. Um, so this, this group uh, from the University of Michigan took a quite a complex quadrupedal model, uh, which had all sorts of springs in it. And they found too that in walking, the optimal solution was to have double hump profiles. And in trotting and, and other running gates, it was to have single hump profiles. And they said, our data supports these other pure spring models that different uh, in that different gates represent different oscillation modes of the legged systems compliance. So this belief that you need to have springs if you want to get um, these, this kind of behavior, but our model doesn't have any springs. 
and yet we get this behavior. So this relates to this concept of pseudo elasticity that if you're optimizing something like work, um, you tend to get solutions that appear to be elastic, even if there is no elasticity in the system. So we can flip this uh, last question, which morphological features matter to which ones don't matter? And it seems like leg elasticity doesn't. And this has um, some implications for the evolution of uh, biological form. For example, um, there's this problem that if you need springs for say a running gait to be optimal, well then how do you evolve that? How do you get the springs first that then lead to the running gait? Whereas what this says is that you can have a running gait and then you can build up tendons and tune them right to optimize that running gait for you. So there's a, a precedence of the gait comes before the, the tendon um, evolution. Um, so there are other morphological features that we include in the model. There's center of mass position, limb lengths, and pitch moment of inertia. Do any of those matter? Or could we get even simpler than this? Um, what I want to argue is that this is pretty much the simplest possible model you can get um, while explaining quite a lot. So let's look first at the center of mass position. Um, uh, it's about here in this model. And what we get is we get qualitatively the right magnitude for the forelimbs and the hindlimbs. This uh, should come as no surprise, and it's a phenomenon that's been known since at least the 40s. Um, and that's, it comes purely from a balance of torques. So if you have a organism that's, that's uh, uh, standing on four legs, then the torques about its center of mass need to balance, right? And so the forelimbs will have maybe a shorter uh, moment arm than the hind limbs if the center of mass is over here. And if the torques balance, that means that if this moment arm is smaller than this moment arm, then this force needs to be larger than this force. And that's all it is. And the same is true over uh, an average stride. The torques have to balance on average. And so that's why um, this happens. But it means that you need a fairly accurate measurement of where the moment of inertia is relative to uh, the joints. So what? So center of mass position seems to be important. What about limb length? Well, I was inspired by Salvador Dali and uh, I made this giant long-limbed elephant. Uh, and what, what I find remarkable about this is that Salvador Dali was, was a smart dude, right? Like, so you'll notice that, that this is supposed to be a trotting solution and it uses a walking trot rather than a flying trot with a four limb stance. And that's exactly what Salvador Dali has drawn. So he was doing optimization in his head when he was drawing this. So that's pretty impressive. But of course, this is not what dogs actually do. Um, they have a flight phase. Um, so if you remove leg length as a constraint, you'll tend to remove that flight phase. Um, but if you make the leg length constraint realistic, then you get something that is realistic with a flight phase in trouble. So limb lengths are important for explaining behavior. Finally, what about the pitch moment of inertia? Now, this is something that I found more and more fascinating the more I look into it. And sadly, there's not enough time to get into the nitty gritty details. But the short of it is that um, if you have a realistic moment of inertia for dogs, uh, the optimal solution is to trot. And if you have a really large moment of inertia, the optimal solution is to tolt, to use a running walk. Um, and there's some really funny stuff about um, the percussion points of the system and all sorts of things. Uh, Jim Usherward is working on a pic uh, paper for Journal of Experimental Zoology. I've had a chance to look at it. Right now it's in review. I highly recommend checking it out um, when it comes out. But this has implications for a biological form because we know that the pitch moment of inertia is something that can drastically change, especially in something as extreme as a giraffe. So giraffes have these huge long necks, which will tend to create a huge pitch moment of inertia. And one of the weird things about giraffes is they never trot, right? So this sort of makes sense from an optimization perspective because trotting is a very expensive solution. Um, and so this is something that we're looking at uh, exploring some more. And we think that it has some bearing biologically. But it seems like pitch moment of inertia is something you need to include in your model. So you do need all these things, but no more is, is uh, what I'm trying to argue. And it's, I think, even more fascinating when you flip this question, what morphological features don't matter? Well, what isn't in my model? There are no elastic elements. Um, 
there are no lower and upper parts of the limb. So there's no elbow joints or wrist joints or anything like that. There are no leg masses and there's no back compliance. There's no head, there's no tail, right? So all these things don't seem to matter that much. Now there's asterisks here because I think there are cases where they do matter, but by and large, they don't seem to. So let's get into that. Let's, let's take a step back and look at all the evidence uh, before us. So what we have here is uh, the duty factor, phase offset, and pair offset, which is a measure of the symmetry of the solution as a function of speed. We'll look at each of those in turn. And so we have, again, the empirical data, and these squares are the optimal solutions according to the model. And it seems to, to not work so well here, but it works really well everywhere else. So we get really good uh, agreement for duty factor above, say, like a slow walk. Um, and I think that the reason we're missing something here is because we are missing um, leg masses. And so if you add, if you think about what should be the optimal swing period, well, it's going to tend towards um, this line if you include leg masses. So that's something we're investigating a bit more. But we also know that the, the ground reaction force profiles match qualitatively with this simple model for walking and running. We can also look at the phase offset. Um, so the, again, these lines represent the phase for each of the right forelimb, the right hind limb and the left forelimb. The left hind limb is, is constrained to just have a phase offset of zero. And um, we see this transition from a lateral sequence walk to a trot, both empirically and in the model. We actually get a really good agreement with that transition point as well. Um, and so we get really good agreement for walking and trotting, but then we should get another transition to galloping and we can see that the model does not agree there. Um, so there's something going on in galloping that can't be explained by this minimal model. But what is interesting is if you look at the symmetry, well, then it does seem to agree. So these two gates are what we call sy symmetrical gates. I won't get into what that means. Whereas galloping is an asymmetrical gate. And uh, the symmetry would, would be if the solutions were all along this line. And what you see is that they're highly symmetrical, highly symmetrical and then suddenly diverge and become a little bit asymmetrical when you get up to galloping speeds. So it seems like there's something to do with uh, asymmetry where once you get up above a certain speed, asymmetry starts to become optimal. So we get pretty good agreement there. So overall, it seems like we're missing some of the uh, features uh, for really high speeds, some of the features for really slow speeds, but in the middle, we're getting super good agreement um, for this really simple model. Now there's these two trouble spots in red and uh, our plans are to tackle them and see what's going on there. One is to add masses to the legs, like I mentioned before. The other is uh, looking at what's going on with galloping. So our, our uh, model does discover galloping is locally optimal, um, but not globally optimal. So this is a galloping solution with a cost of transport of 0.58. The asymmetrical trot, which is the optimal solution, costs of transport of 0.56, which is only a little bit smaller. Now, this is an issue that has been known for a while. Um, these guys who I mentioned before, with a really sophisticated model, found the same problem that above a certain speed, um, galloping and trotting are about the same uh, cost. And the way they resolve this is by adding compliance in the back. So what I think is going on is that uh, in galloping, you get uh, sort of a, an impulse passing through the, um, through the torso. And that impulse can cause uh, a collision with the ground that is then lost as a form of energy. But if you add um, a spring to your system, then that can absorb that uh, energy and release it later on in the cycle and save you a, a bit of uh, energy. So that, would, that might explain why galloping occurs if there's elastic elements in the back. But again, just like the elastic elements in the legs, what we wonder is, well, maybe it's not to do with elasticity. Maybe active compliance would also allow this to happen. So that's the next uh, stage of changing this model to allow the back to extend and contract actively. And maybe then we'll find galloping is still optimal. Uh, despite these issues, a, middle, a minimal model does quite well overall. There's no springs. There's no complex morphology, very few constraints and any gate is possible. And yet natural gates emerge as optimal gates. And from this, uh, I, can, uh, I conclude that energy optimization does seem to explain gate selection in dogs and probably in other quadrupeds as well. 
the work and force rate penalty is the best fitting cost function. Um, and, but we can get realistic emergent behavior from very simple models. Um, we only need a few morphological parameters as inputs. Springs might help, but they aren't necessary. Um, I have a little bit of time, so I'm going to talk about some potential applications of this. Uh, one key one is in paleontology. So uh, an issue in paleontology is that we have the morphology of the organism or some sense of it with fossilized remains, but we seldom have an idea of, of how they were actually moving. So what we need to use usually is some extant proxy of the extinct organism as sort of a reference to say, well, these two things had similar morphology, so they probably moved in the same way. But what we can do with our model is we can bypass the extant proxy and we can go straight from morphology to some emergent gate. And, and this is especially important to have minimal models because you don't have as much morphological information that you have with uh, the extant organisms. Um, we did a brief test case where we also <coughs> thought about, well, what about the reverse? If you have a certain football sequence, could you go backwards and say, what is the morphology that corresponds to this, um, this um, sequence? So we did that with um, a, a group of sort of extinct, um, uh, extinct llama relatives. And uh, there's a, a certain um, a fossilized trackway that's been associated with that group, but they're not sure which species within that group um, it belongs to. And so we have um, the, this is the actual trackway that we uh, see. Um, these are the, or sorry, these are, sorry, this is the optimal trackway that we generate. This is the um, uh, fossilized trackway, and we can compare the, the discrepancy between them to come up with which one of these species fits that trackway the best. What we find is that these two definitely don't, and these two uh, definitely do. So that's a potential application for this model. Another is in exploring extreme morphology, such as the giraffe. We've already done this a little bit. We found a fairly good agreement with the pattern of locomotion that emerges. Um, and then finally, another application is in veterinary medicine. As I mentioned before, the gait is quite plastic using the example of amputated dog. That wasn't an accident. What we find is that dogs after amputation, after an injury, will go through a period of adapting their gait to the new circumstance. And what you find, at least for trotting, is that it's pretty much the same. Um, so this is what happens uh, normally. Uh, this is, again, a, a gait diagram. And then if you remove a limb, this is, this is uh, what their new gait is. And it's pretty much the same, just as if that, that limb isn't there. And so one argument is that well, it's just because the motor control system is designed to use this particular gate. And so it's just going to keep using that gate just without this extra limb. But what we're showing is that it actually emerges as optimal. So uh, perhaps they're not actually doing that. Perhaps they are optimizing again to their new circumstance. Um, and this could have implications for uh, how we uh, assess the um, the recovery of the dog to say an amputation or an injury. Um, so that's about it. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you very much for your time. Any questions for Delisle? Yeah. Uh, Delisle. The elements that you said aren't important. Do you think if you move from level trotting and walking to either, I guess, say downhill trotting or galloping, do these things become more important? Or like, is the force rate penalty as important in downhill locomotion as, as it would be in level running locomotion? Um, the short answer is I don't know. Um, the long answer is we, we do know that there is changes in the gait response with changes in uh, the inclination of the surface. So, for example, um, when most quadrupeds are, are, say, on a treadmill or they're asked to go up a slope, they'll transition to a slow gallop or a canter earlier than if than on level ground. And so, there's some argument. Well, maybe that has to do with power limitations. Uh, like, who knows, really? But that is something that we can explore with the model. Right now, I I don't have an intuitive sense of what might be important there or not. 
myself. Oh, so I sort of the model is to do the emulation of pulsate energy. I think you use f dot. Mm -hmm. I use f dot squared. Um, I have Can you tried. The question? Sorry. Can you repeat the question? Oh, so the question was how how sensitive is the model to the formulation of the force rate penalty? Let me see if I can um, get back to show what it is. Do, do, do. It's over. Um, I can't find it, but be, but basically the force rate penalty is the rate of change of the force squared uh, times some constant integrated through time. Um, and so there's many different formulations that have been proposed, but uh, Rabula and Quo, 2015, showed that really the formulation doesn't really seem to matter that much. So um, I have tried a few different formulations, um, the, and they all do seem to give the same behavior for any given model. What it does become important is how it scales morphologically. So a weird thing about the force rate penalty is it breaks dimensional similarity. So normally we can, we can think of say like a small dog and a large dog moving at the same absolute speed or moving at very different dynamic speeds. But if we normalize to the gravity, the gravity that they're experiencing and the length of say their leg, then when they're moving at that same normalized speed, then they have the same behavior. So this idea of dynamic similarity. Um, but if you add a force rate term, it breaks that. And so morphology ends up becoming a part of, uh, say, the level that force rate matters to you versus something that's larger or smaller. And the different formulations does affect how that scales. So that's, in that sense, I'm thinking about, OK, how does this work? But for now, it seems for given species that's more or less the same morphologically, it, it doesn't really matter what the formation is. So this, this question might be related to the previous one that can be answered. And maybe it's an unfair question because I'm preying a little bit on the uh, the ends of the spectrum of your yep. model sure. where it doesn't fit so well. But mm -hmm. really, I just wonder if there's a common constraint on maximal velocity that you would suggest. What's the limiting factor, for example, say, the galloping horse? A common constraint on maximum velocity, so like the velocity of extension and contraction of the limb or something like that? Yeah, okay, that and, and just the, the overall effectiveness of the stride and, and velocity around it. Uh, so. Okay, so are you asking if there's a constraint on how fast, like the absolute speed that the animal can move? Well, there, there certainly is, um, but those, those uh, speeds that I was showing are speeds that animals use naturally. So the, this data back here, let me see if I can go back to it. Um, this, this empirical data was taken from actual dogs actually moving at this actual speed, right? So um, they are galloping and they are able to do that and they choose to gallop at those speeds. So it's not a constraint of they can't actually move that fast. Um, there might be a physiological constraint in terms of, say, like, how, what's the maximum rate of contraction that they can use for their muscle or something like that. You know, they, we know that there's a, um, the, the force velocity relationship in muscle is quite important for lots of behavior. So that, that is something to consider. But I don't think that that's what's going on because that would mean that the duty factor should be, uh, say, much different than my simulations, which it isn't. So the, the duty factor is really going to be related to that problem. So I don't think that's it. I don't think it's a velocity limitation. I don't think it's a physiological limitation. I think it is something to do with my model and there's some morphological element that I'm missing or some degree of freedom that is constrained and shouldn't be. Yeah, John. Yeah, so you had the simple very simple model with massless legs mm -hmm. explain a large amount of what these animals naturally do mm -hmm. and then you want to maybe add mass to the legs to in your prediction is it might be able to explain the parts that can't be explained by the really simple model, like the slow walk that's right 
So what are the chances that adding the mass to the legs will mean that your model doesn't predict normal locomotion anymore? I think there's a non-zero chance that, that could be that could happen. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. But there's only one way to find out, right? But that it's gone through this sequence with bipedal locomotion. Mm -hmm. And it just got better with more components. That's that's true. That is true. Now, the, the, the bipedal modeling is, is no, mostly restricted to human locomotion. And humans have weirdly massive legs. Like if you look at, if you look at artiodactyls, if you look at horses, most of the mass is way up on the body. And so the relative moment of inertia is quite a lot smaller than what humans experience. So I, my suspicion is that the leg swing problem, the leg moment of inertia issue, is much more important for human locomotion and for most quadrupedal locomotion. But we'll just have to see. Kind of storage and return of energy. Yeah. It's not at all in your model. That's right. While Bechni Alexander Storm's famous one, it's basically the essence of his model. Uh, I wouldn't, mm, I would disagree that it's the essence of his model. Okay, but it's very important. Uh, he does he does point to storage and return of energy as being important for galloping. Um, but I, I think that like if you look at a lot of the models that he did in the late 70s and 80s, um, even more recent models in the early 2000s, he was focusing a lot on, on work and on limb work. And it's true that he added compliance as part of the model, but the optimization was still on work that was being done. Um, and I'm not, I don't think he ever fully removed elasticity, storage and return from his models. Um, so you're right there, but it turns out you don't really need them, it seems. So what does that mean practically? What does that mean practically? Well, it, it has, I think, implications, again, for the, for the evolution of gait, um, that the elasticity isn't a necessary step before these gates can develop, that you can develop the gate and then tune your elasticity to complement the gate. So it's true that the storage and return does make your gate more efficient. I'm not denying that. It's just I'm not, I don't think that it's a necessary first step in the evolution of this gate. Uh, the other implications are, um, I don't know. I, I, I know that a lot of people focus a lot on elasticity as a determinant of gate. Maybe it's time that we started focusing on work a bit more, on optimization a bit more. Yeah. I think it would be uh, interesting to bring up that point that the solution without springs and the solution with springs, like the Remy model, mm -hmm. are identical. So you don't know what the spring is really doing. Yeah, yeah they're close. Yeah, they're subtly different, but yeah, they're very close. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, if, if you have a spring, then the way to use it is to, to sort of use its oscillatory modes as, as Remy and the people that developed that other model pointed out, right? But then the question is, what is the appropriate spring constant for your model, right? And oftentimes what people do is they take the, the behavior and they tune that spring constant to match that behavior. You could argue I'm doing a similar thing with the force rate term, um, but I, it's, I think it's a bit problematic because often those spring constants don't actually match what what the measured um, spring constant of the tendon is. Even so there's a question of, well, what is the elasticity of the system? So I don't know. Third row and then right. Sorry, the gentleman in the third row. Do you have a question? Oh, I was just going to make a comment. Just thinking about what you were saying because there's there's sort of an example of that that exists within horses and the phenotypic variation of a horse, horses that are selected for high speed work, like racing, have very uh, low, they have, a, they have a much lower mass to their limb and to the skeleton. There's, there's a lot of consistency between the tendons and the shape, size, and configuration of fibers in the tendons of these different horses, but there's variation in limb mass and bone size. Mm -hmm. And so that may be an example of what can you can you elaborate like an example of for a thoroughbred racehorse, for example? Yeah. You know, 
there's there are other horses of similar mass and stature and size mm -hmm. that, that have a much larger bone mass foot size mm -hmm. especially okay. yeah. they're most distal limb the lower bones mm -hmm. of the foot are much bigger and heavier and those horses are hopeless at racing right. and if you cut the tendons of, of the horse like that and, and a thoroughbred they would look the same you wouldn't mm -hmm. tell them apart but you can tell them apart by looking at <coughs> the other hands of the yeah. features of their limb mm -hmm. so those in those animals also pay a significant price for that work because they've been selected to have extremely lightweight limbs, yep. so they're essentially disposable animals. In yeah, the last sure. few years, they break, they're discarded, and the right. next generation is put to the test. Yeah, yeah. But the, but yeah, they, so so this is back to that issue of, of swinging the leg. You want to move your mass as close up as high as possible. Yeah. Well, and, and yeah. The work sure. of that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So you've shown quite a bit of evidence um, in terms of how well your model agrees with the kinematics of empirical data and kinetics of empirical data. Mm -hmm. uh, have you made any comparisons, any um, sort of, um, quantifiable comparisons between the actual cost of your model to some metabolic data? Or No, I have not done that. I have not done that. So you don't have any sense? Or... Um, <clears throat> Mm, I very, yeah, I don't, I don't really know. Yeah, sorry. Okay. So related to your question, to the previous discussion about the stem and stuff, so you argue that well, this complex model, which has all these springs and all that stuff, results in the same behavior, let's say, in terms mm -hmm. of football patterns. Yeah. Um, so which one of those is cheaper? Which this, one? This thing or the thing with all the tendons? Probably the thing with all the tendons is probably cheaper. But I mean, there's, there's other things at play. For example, in that model, they have massive legs, whereas in this sure. one, I don't. So then, it's, it's tough to compare. But I mean, if you, if you add elasticity and you time things right, then you can recover some of the work that's being done. Sure. Right? And there's less that's being lost through collisions sure. with the ground. But then I don't, do not really understand your conclusion. So you start out the talk and saying that gates are optimized with respect to energy consumption yep. and now you're telling me that tendons reduce energy consumption mm -hmm. yep and at the same time you're concluding that tendons are not important so i don't i, I yes okay I, I maybe, feel that there is a maybe i should here. qualify this i don't think they're important i don't think they're necessarily important for modeling optimal behavior i don't think they they're a necessary component of a model that describes gait i don't think that they're necessary for the evolutionary precursors of what we consider modern gait as okay. well. So this, that, those are the two things where I think they don't matter. Okay. That you, you could have an organism that has badly tuned tendons, right, and yet runs efficiently. And then you have the evolution of that tendon to be tuned sure. properly for that gait. Um, similarly, if, if you have a model, you don't need to include springs, whereas most people, well, not most people, many people do think that I have to include springs in my model. What I'm saying is you don't necessarily. So basically you're saying that you do not require tendons to explain coordination patterns in animals, but they do help to reduce the metabolic cost. Yes, that is what I'm saying. So I agree. Yeah. Uh, if, we, uh, if we try to uh, make a bipedal animal like human, Mm -hmm. Run the same way, would you think the model results the same uh, energetic cost? Um, the same energetic cost as the same as what? The, uh, the same, same as the same beauty factor and the, the same result. Um, I, I do because it's been done. Oh. Yeah. So people, pe my my model is based on earlier work that's been done by people like uh, Manoj Srinivasan and Andy Ruina and Jabal Hassani. <laughs> Who have all used very similar models without springs, very simplistic, or in, even Art Quo. I don't know if he's here right now, but um, and and what they do find is that it, it does work well. Now, um, uh, arts arts modeling is actually one of one of the things that led me on to this force rate penalty because what he found in his very simple bipedal models is that if he minimized work, it didn't predict the um, speed step length relationship or 
the speed uh, duty factor relationship. And he tried a whole bunch of um, augmentations to the cost function, one of which was the force rate term. And it was the force rate term that really did seem to explain um, this behavior. So, so yeah, the answer is yes, it would work. And I know this because it's been done already. Um, uh, but you, you do still need some of the elements that I mentioned, like a, a force rate term, for example. Paul, just maybe continuing that, that force rate is important when you go into the energetics is obvious from the master mechanics, mm -hmm. because uh, <clears throat> if you shorten or elongate at different, at different speeds, that highly changes the efficiency of muscular contraction. Mm -hmm. and therefore, you would be important if you have to increase it. Yeah. If you wanted to get the energetics correct, and if you think the muscles play an important role there. I've got a couple of other questions. When you predict in your model uh, trotting, mm -hmm. do you predict an asymmetric or, a, or, or like a yeah, kind of a diagonal or, or a one sided trot? Uh, or, or, or are they both essentially coming out naturally as the same? Uh, so you mean, is there is there sort of a disparity between contact of the fore and hind limb, or are they simultaneous? Yeah, is know, that what you're asking? Uh, horses can trot either with the, you know, to make a football pattern, mm -hmm. with the left fore limb and the right hind limb, yeah. or with left, left, or right, right. Oh, okay. So, so the, the difference yeah, between a pace and a trot. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um, I sort of uh, glazed over this. But since this is a planar model, there is there is really no distinction between those two. Right, so um, yeah, there's there's no distinction between a left leg coming in contact with the ground or a right leg, and so in a planar sense, a, tr a trot and a pace look identical. Yeah, and you know, uh, in, in, there was a lot of discussion about the elast elastic elements or not. And, mm -hmm. uh, when you initially started talking about that, you don't have an elastic element, I'm going, well, you actually do because you allow your limb to get shorter and longer, mm -hmm. and. Uh, that might not be elastic in the sense that you uh, that you store and release yeah. energy. But for example, if you say that I'm compressing the limb, you associate that with a certain metabolic cost, mm -hmm. and then you have an elongation of the limb, yeah, and associate that with a different metabolic cost because you say one is an eccentric contraction, one yeah. is concentric. Sure. Then, then you're almost back to elasticity. I would argue. Um, I I would argue. I, I have to disagree with that. Um, I, I would agree that it is compliance, so that both both cases you're adding compliance to the model. Um, but it's it's not the same thing as elasticity because if it, it if it was elastic, then the negative work that's been done by the limb could be released passively as positive work, whereas that is not the case in this case. Does that and, make sense? Uh, so how do you how do you associate the metabolic cost? And the work mm -hmm. when your limb is compressed, and compared to when it's extending, because I'm, I would associate one more is eccentric mm -hmm. muscle action, yep. and the other one more is concentric. Right. So what what you're getting at is the different efficiency of eccentric versus concentric yep. contraction. That is not actually included here, and it actually doesn't matter. You'll you'll get the exact same behavior if you scale um, the eccentric and uh, uh, concept contractions to whatever you want. Um, the reason is that the model has to do exactly the same amount of negative work as it does positive work. So it's just work at the end of the day. And so you can optimize on just positive work or just negative work or scale both however you want and you'll get the same result. It might be important in terms of when you try to compare it to elastic energy because people have always said that tendons would be more useful because then the fascicles would not elongate, yep. they would actually tendon and elongates and shortens. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't really cost you any work, but that's really not correct because when the fascicle stays isometric mm -hmm. and the tendon elongates and shortens, then then during elongation of the fascicle, the fascicle would actually elongate and there would be less work. And when it shortened, there would be more work. And the average it would be about the same amount of work, I would guess. Mm -hmm. And so you're probably coming in out is the right result by assuming one work rate mm -hmm. because what you're underestimating the one you probably yeah. overestimating the other and the average yeah. is right. I, I, I would agree, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree. So I, I kind of see an elasticity there, but maybe maybe not. Yeah. I want to talk about something completely different. Uh, um, cross country skiing. Okay. <laughs> it's a four legged gate. 
Uh, yeah, I guess you could argue. Sure. He caused a get enormous propulsions from legs and arms. Mm -hmm. And I've always claimed that he crossed country skis. People employ a gate that I've not seen in an animal. You're probably the person to ask. So hmm. Are you a cross country skier? I, I, not, not very much. Okay, I do, so do it day. casually sometimes. So when you do what we call a one skate technique, yeah. then you have a left foot hold pattern and you give a push with both arms mm -hmm. and a right push <coughs> and you give a, a push with both your arms. Okay. So you use your arms, you leave your left arm twice as many times as the right, as okay. the left leg and yeah. you use your right arm twice as many times as the right leg. Huh. Is there a gate like that in an animal? Um, I, I don't think so, but I don't know if I fully understand this. So you're skiing along and... I'm going to you. <laughs> okay, yes, please, please do. Push, yeah. push, push. So I'm pushing on the right. Oh, okay, yeah. And I'm pushing on the left, so I'm using the left and the right arm. Push, on push, exactly. push. I mean, that sort of is like a pace. If you think of your arms as, you know, if you think of the arm on this side as being your left forelimb, as just sort of aggregate one left forelimb, and your arms on this side being one right forelimb. Does that make sense? So the, the contact sequence looks like looks like a pace. And that might make sense because your your leg muscles are much more powerful than your arm muscles. So you might need both to sort of... <laughs> I don't, I don't know, maybe that doesn't make sense. No. But, but also, the, the, it, it's also not, it, I don't think it can be the same because in cross-country skiing, you're always in contact with the ground or most of the time you're in contact with the ground. And that, that's the difference between the four-legged animal that your legs have essentially the same speed as your center of mass. Uh, Whereas the arms do not when they're grounded. Yeah, yeah. So you have two poles that are stuck yeah. in the ground and you zoom in fast. Yeah. So you're limiting in time when you go faster, whereas with the skis you're not limited because you're yeah. riding along. Exactly. So I yeah, it's 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 different, right? Because in in legged locomotion you're constrained to where your foot lands, that's where it stays until exactly. you pick it up. But in skiing you're not. So the but yeah. The interesting idea. thing about that is then there is this other technique where you use your arms only on every second link. So you, mm -hmm. now you go left, right, push, and mm -hmm. left, right, push. So it's a galloping gait, essentially. Yeah, interesting. And, and the interesting thing is that in the one state and two state, the cost of transport curves intersect twice. Huh. So you have these two different gait patterns. Yeah. And in normal animals that I've seen, the cost of transport curves between two gates only intersect once. once yeah. Typically, yeah. Yeah, here they actually intersect twice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that and is interesting. So then your prediction would be that they change the gate twice. Yeah. So you they do. So you could you could you could make a a simple optimization model. I challenge you to uh, use a minimal. <laughs> well, we uh, have the experimental data. Okay. That I can give to you, and you have the optimization. <laughs> Sure, we can we can talk about that after. But they actually yeah. do change from a, one technique, yeah. reject that technique at intermediate speeds, but mm -hmm. then at the high speed they come back. They so come back to it, yeah. And it seems they intersect. You, you you actually do see that a bit with with my modeling. So depending on how you play around with the center of mass position or the moment of inertia, uh, what you can get, for example, is you get a, a slow walk, a slow trot, and then a fast walk. So there is there is sort of maybe an analogy there that it is possible that depending on your parameters that you could get something two things that look similar they are different in terms of um, uh, say duty factor but in terms of contact sequence they're exactly the same. So, yeah. The other thing that that you talked about when you talked about uh, the frequency you know kind of like having a higher frequency mm -hmm. and uh, and that costing more more energy. Again, did you mention that possibly the turning on and off of the muscle might be that, and, yep. and that, that costs an enormous amount of energy. Mm -hmm. So in many movements, we find that when you turn off, you do the same amount of work, mm -hmm. when you turn off muscles in more times, mm -hmm. and on more times, you get a higher frequency, typically it ends up metabolically yep. less efficient. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I, this, I've, I've talked to, to Art about this um, quite a few times. And I think one of the ideas is that it's the calcium pumping that costs you because you need to, you, you know, you set up the calcium gradient, you, you're, the passive channel is open, but then you actively have to establish that gradient again. And so that might, might lead to this cost, but yeah, it's, it's hard to connect that physiological mechanism to something like a, like a kinetic force rate. Like how, how exactly does that, does that fit together? And in my, in my ideal world, you'd have some like parameters of the muscle and you would do some derivations and you would get a force rate cost that links that sort of micro that the, the physiology of muscle to this overall exact behavior. Physiology is actually people still question, but, but if you activate a muscle and you hold it for 10 seconds, or you activate a muscle for a second and then relax and you activate it again mm -hmm. for a second and do the 10 times, and then you have a total contraction time 10 times, yeah. the energy required is infinitely higher, much, much higher yeah. than you do 10 times longer rather yeah. than one times 10. Yeah, I've, I've seen some studies that do that, yeah. We, so. we, we looked a little bit at that by manipulating the frequency in double polling of cross country skiing. That's, that's exactly what it came about. When you use longer and longer poles in double polling, you tend to do it at a slower and slower rate. Mm -hmm. And if you have it on an uphill slope, the work that you do is exactly the same, but the mm -hmm. energetic cost becomes less oh, interesting. as you do yeah. the movement slower with the longer poles. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So it kind of goes exactly to what you were saying. Or do you have any more support there? <laughs> well, I would just like to reply. I have a couple more, but yeah. oh, sorry, Walter. <laughs> no, no, go, go. I would just like to reply briefly to this point of Walter, and I think namely that this point does not pertain to your optimizations because the force rate. So you're talking about frequency, how many times per second you turn the muscle on and off, but the force rate in the Laos model does not at all tune frequency because the frequency stays the same. Yeah, but, but it, it just re just. Uh, alters the shape of the forces, right? So if I have one impulsive force at the beginning and one impulsive force at the end, that's still two impulsive forces per gate, mm -hmm. right? So I don't understand exactly why this um, this argument about the frequency of contraction pertains to this simulation. Well, that's when I started out by saying when you have a higher rate of shortening, then that there's just an optimal efficiency of the muscle in shortening, that's at about 30% of its maximum velocity. Uh, but that's a completely different process that's than what you were just talking about, one, right? Yeah. So okay. that's, that's the one I mentioned very early on. And then I came with the thing. So there's two different things here. Oh, right. yeah. yeah. So when you don't work at an optimal shortening velocity, then, then how much a certain amount of work will cost you is higher. Right. And there we go. Okay. But then, but do you then think that this effect is a force velocity effect, or is it? Effect has to do with the frequency of turning the muscle on and off, because those are two different. They, they are two different things. Right? They're okay. completely independent. Like I see. They, but they, what do you think is happening here? Well, I well, you have the force rate in there, mm -hmm. and all I was saying to that, I just said that had to be in there if you want to be accurate I in the energetics. Mm -hmm. and then I said there's another factor potentially, and mm -hmm. then is the is the frequency factor. I see. Yeah, maybe a follow up with that. Do you think if maybe in some of those dogs that only have two limbs, if you replace the other limbs with actuators that don't have to deal with force velocity, like uh -huh. uh, just an energetic cost, do you think they would lean towards one that is just like a work term, or do you think it would still show something? And the reason I ask that uh -huh. is that I wonder if in that force rate term there's also something avoiding like you know tissue stress or something like that. Yeah, there might there this. might be there yeah. there could be a lot going on, okay. um, and. And, and so it's it's, um, I I don't know with with uh, with cyborg dogs if they would that would change their optimization. I, I think it's a it's a tricky thing, um, and it's something that the people in the gate rehab world and the prosthetic world are still kind of trying to think about um, how how do people adapt when they have 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 a, a prosthetic on, um, and it's it seems like optimization has is part of it but there's also sort of a comfort thing as well so i don't know i don't know if that's the right experiment to probe this question but it is an interesting it's an interesting idea my my intuition is that it's probably the same because if you know you're, you're using a certain amount of energy regardless when you're on two legs if 
if the other legs are giving you something for free, I think you'll tend to rely on them more. But if you still have to do something with those legs, then the same optimization is still going to happen with those legs. So I, I don't think it would change the relationship. I could add a comment to that. <clears throat> there was a study on transtubial, unilateral <coughs> transtubial um, uh, uh, individuals walking on split belt treadmills at differential speeds. Mm -hmm. They adapted for metabolic reasons the same way as healthy people did, but that involved using the ankle at very specific times in the gait. So, of course, the transtibial amputees didn't have that available. What they did was they did the same gait characteristics, but they used tip, uh, torque at the hip, which is not as effective as using your ankle, but they arrived at the same optimal gait under the odd circumstances. Any more questions for Delisle? I was just wanted to probe one last thing because yeah. if you said you when the skate gets faster and faster there, that you then tend to go to uh, to an asymmetrical uh, behavior, yeah. and that might be better. Yeah. Why, why do you, Why do you think that is? I have no idea. I honestly don't. Because my my intuition says that. Symmetry should almost always be optimal from a work perspective. Um, so I don't know why symmetry is And And I'm, I'm still not confident that it's not numerical noise. So what I do know, um, I, can show, I can show you this plot. Why not? So this is um, paper I'm working on. Oops, wrong application. Um, So let's do this. Any LaTeX users here? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. And if you go down and find the plot, there it is. So this is fun. Um, what this is showing is um, three, three ways of parameterizing phase in, um, in various gates. This is slow speeds. This is a trotting speed. This is a slow gallop and a fast gallop. And all these dots are all the solutions that I found. So each of them is probably close to locally optimal, but maybe not due to numerical issues. What you see is that at slow speeds, there's a very clear clustering of the solutions. And so these turn out to be the diagonal and lateral sequence single foot walk, which is the dogs use the lateral, but anyway, they're the same in, the, in a planar sense. As you increase speed, you get less and less clustering. So it turns out that at high speeds, that there's not much difference between these different gates in terms of optimality. And you can kind of see some clustering if you squint really hard, like here and here, which represent gallops. Um, and you sort of see this line, which is could be a canter, for example. So it, it seems like all these natural gates are maybe locally optimal in a sense, but uh, for this model, not globally optimal. Um, so I had a thousand um, uh, uh, implementations of, of the model, so a thousand different random guesses that all converged to some solution. And the asymmetry persisted, but I'm still not convinced 100% that it's not just random chance that it turned out to be asymmetric. Because I honestly don't have a, an intuition as to why asymmetry would be optimal in that case. Well, the only reason why I mention it is going back to cross-country skiing, so the <laughs> kind of typical racing speed on a flat, that's maybe 20, 25, 26 kilometers, they would use the symmetrical gait, mm -hmm. but when they sprint and they go over 30 kilometers per hour, they yeah. go to this asymmetrical gait mm -hmm. at a very high speed. And that yeah. intrigues me because uh, that's, again, the game, Skiing is obviously not the same as a dog running or a mm -hmm. horse running because of the different constraints in the legs. Yeah. But, uh, but I was intrigued by that. Yeah. And I I've been intrigued that uh, a lot of cross-country skiing is actually highly asymmetrical. Yeah. yeah, and so again, I think the, the explanation of compliance in the back is the only one that makes sense to me as to why galloping the asymmetrical gait is optimal at higher speeds. But then I still don't know if, if it's maybe not the elasticity, but just the compliance of the back. And so there could be something that, I don't know, in these asymmetrical gates, are people really bending their backs 
when they when they do them in cross country skiing? Is that involved? Yeah, certain extent, I guess. Yeah. Maybe so. Maybe maybe that's something to do with it. I don't know. The horse can maybe respiratory chain it, so they're they're forced to couple their mm. strides frequency with the respiratory pattern. Are they forced, or do they? Well, I guess that may, yeah, that, that's yeah. a debatable term. They yeah. do it, yeah. And we've been we've been doing VO2 max measurements in Gallagher Moses on the racetrack, mm. and it seems to be the limiting factor in the performance. So they, is it that they can't they can't breathe faster, or they choose not to? We think they can't. They they mm. can't. You don't see horses typically take extra breaths during a stride cycle. Yeah. They'll take they'll do one ventilation yeah. for each stride sure. cycle. Sure. Which makes sense because the compression of yeah. the body with the diaphragm. They've got but, a massive colon that slams using, up against their diaphragm. They're uh -huh. using it essentially as a yeah, interesting. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so. So, like, well, there's a comment. I don't want to go back to cross country. But, see, the good thing in humans, you can do that. You can uh -huh. have them breathe in an entrained manner. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Or, in a yeah. non entrained manner, saves yeah. you 5% of oxygen uptake at a given work rate. Okay, interesting. Yeah. So, so people have always argued that that probably saves animals in running mm -hmm. uh, a certain amount of energy, and but of course in animals you cannot tell them not to breathe in a tree manner because yep. they're just doing when they run hard. Yeah. But it does seem to save energy when they do that. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, so they, there's some weirdness going on for galloping. Um, and so I think that the first step is to say, well, okay, if we add compliance in the back, does this make galloping optimal? If it, if it does, then, well, maybe that's what explains it. If it doesn't, then maybe there's other things going on, like these issues with breathing. Let me just the last comment on the galloping portion at the maximum speed. You know, I have no idea about maximum speed, but Alan Wilson, <coughs> who has studied this, his argument always was that, that the four limbs in a race horse and galloping horse, they actually come forward purely passively. They're swung back so mm -hmm. much, and then it's a passive, it's a passive uh, structural thing that brings them forward. Okay. And and he said that uh, that that passive forward bringing of the legs and what structural elements you have that was limiting how fast a horse could run. According to Alan Wilson, I've no idea okay. if it's true or not. Yeah, I I would argue that. I mean, sure, if it's if it's passive, you can do that. But what's to what's to prevent you from actively making that happen, right? So anyway, Brian, okay. you want the last question? Sure. Um, the the amount of scatter that you see at the higher speeds, do you, do you think that's real, or do you think that's again just a limitation of something that your model is missing? Real, real so in me, what sense? So real is in represented because you don't see. All kinds of gate gate choice variability in in dogs or I don't know in, in any four legged animals right at these higher speeds they pretty consistent choices. Uh, is, uh, is that true? It, it it is more consistent than this would let you to believe, but it does get more variable the higher the speed you go. So yeah. it sounds like maybe you think there's maybe it's maybe somewhat representative of reality. I but I, I think I think that it is representative of different gates sort of converging on sort of a very similar costs. But I do think that I'm missing some elements of the dynamics here, which would differentiate some of these solutions as less costly than others. Um, so it's, there'd yeah. still be increasing scatter, but maybe not quite as exaggerated. I, I think so. Okay. Yeah. All right, now that Delisle has another 25 years of research to get <laughs> <laughs>